Good afternoon. I'm Nikki Jones, Professor in H. Michael and Jeannie Williams, Department Chair of African American Studies here at Cal. And I am thrilled to welcome you to our fourth conversation in this year's series, Critical Conversations Catching Up with June. This is the first conversation of our spring semester and it is right on time as always, learning from June Jordan, a poetry for the people conversation. Although we meet today in virtual space, I wanna begin with the acknowledgement that the Department of African American Studies in UC Berkeley sits on the territory of Huchum, the ancestral and unceded land of the Chichenyo speaking Ohlone people, the successors of the sovereign Verona band of Alameda County. This land was and continues to be of great importance to the Moekma Ohlone tribe and other familial descendants of the Verona band. We recognize that every member of the Berkeley community has and continues to benefit from the use and occupation of this land since the institution's founding in 1868. Consistent with our values of community inclusion and diversity, we have a responsibility to acknowledge and make visible the university's relationship to native peoples. As members of the Berkeley community, it is vitally important that we not only recognize the history of the land on which we stand, but also that the Muwekma Ohlone people are alive and flourishing members of the Berkeley and broader Bay Area communities today. And we thank UC Berkeley Center for Educational Justice and Community Engagement and the Native American Student Development Office for crafting this acknowledgement. As I said at the top, today's conversation, learning from June Jordan, a poetry for the people conversation is the fourth installment in our year long celebration of the life and legacy of writer, activist, and longtime UC Berkeley faculty member, June Jordan. Building our, our successful spring 2021 series, celebrating doc, Dr. Barbara Christian and exploring the concept of abolition democracy, our Critical Conversation series continues to ask, what are the lessons of the Black feminist, Black radical, Black radical, and Black intellectual traditions for our moment? And what is the role of Black studies in building more just futures? The Critical Conversation series is supported by the Abolition Democracy Initiative, and you can read more about the ADI on our website. Uh, we appreciate the support of the Office of the Executive Vice Chancellor and Provost, the Office of the Chancellor and the Dean of Social Sciences, Rafa Ray. I also want to acknowledge and thank the members of the ADI leadership team, Professors Eula Taylor, Lee Ray Rayford, and Tiana Paschel for their leadership and the vision that helped to create the Abolition Democracy Initiative. You can find a full schedule for the remaining events in this year's Critical Conversation Series on our department's website. Today's event is being recorded uh, and will be posted along with other conversation in this series on the department's YouTube channel. Uh, a live transcript of this recording is also being uh, uh, generated. Uh, there, it, you can uh, on Zoom. You can use the CC button for closed captioning. Uh, and another logistical point: as we move through the conversation, uh, please submit uh, questions through the Q and A feature. Uh, let's leave the chat for uh, the shout outs and the love and the appreciation, uh, and use the Q and A um, to post questions. Also, if you're having any AV trouble, you can use the chat for that as well. Uh, just a couple of uh, final thank yous before I turn to my introduction of our, our, our uh, moderator for today, Professor Chayuma Elliott. I wanna thank uh, Rachel Ansbach, Ansbach and Kayana Pajaro for the administrative and logistical support for today's event. Uh, and throughout the entire year, Rachel has been outstanding in helping us to organize uh, the Critical Conversations theories, series. Uh, thank you to our colleagues at ETS for supporting the webinar for today's event and again uh, throughout the year. A big thank you to all of you who are joining and watching this conversation live uh, or who are going to be watching this uh, a recording of the conversation and our deepest thanks to the panelists for taking the time uh, to be here today. I'm looking forward to sitting back and listening and learning uh, from this conversation. So let me now turn to introducing my outstanding and brilliant colleague, Professor Chayuma Elliott. Uh, Professor Elliott is Associate Professor of African American Studies at the University of California, Berkeley. Our scholarly work and teaching focus on poetry and poetics, visual culture and intellectual history from the 1920s to the present. Before joining the Berkeley faculty, Professor Elliott was a Wallace Stegner Fellow at Stanford and Assistant Professor of English Creative Writing and African American Studies at the University of Mississippi. A Cave Canem Alumni Fellow, she has also received fellowships from the American Philosophical Society, the James Irvine Foundation and the Vermont Studio Center. She earned her MFA in creative writing from Warren Wilson College and her PhD in American Studies from the University of Texas at Austin. Professor Elliott has published four books of poetry, Blue and Green, published in 2021 at most, in 2020, Vigil in 2017, and California Winter League in 2015. 
Her creative work has appeared in the African American Review, Callaloo, The Collegist, the Notre Dame, Notre Dame Review, the PN Review, and other journals. She is the co-editor of several poetry chapbooks, including African American Poetic Responses to Faulkner and Of Rivers. She is currently at work on a poem cycle called Hemlin and a scholarly monograph about rural life in the Harlem Renaissance. And I cannot think of a better person to help us usher us into this conversation. I turn it to you, Professor Elliott. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, I'm Shaima Elliott. I have the honor of curating the spring series of the Critical Conversations reading, celebrating the life and legacy of fellow poet and former UC Berkeley faculty member, June Jordan. Professor Jordan died in 2002 and is still keenly missed around here. Um, today, we'll be talking about her revolutionary program, Poetry for the People, and hearing the work of two of its alums, Samia Bashir and Sulma Sharif. But before I introduce them and give you a little bit of background, uh, background about P4P, I want to put one of June Jordan's poems into the air. It's called These Poems. These poems, they are things that I do in the dark, reaching for you, whoever you are, and are you ready? These words, they are stones in the water, running away. These skeletal lines, they are desperate arms for my longing and love. I am a stranger learning to worship the strangers around me, whoever you are, whoever I may become. So audience, are you ready? Poetry for the People, affectionately known as P4P, was formally established here at Cal in 1991 by Jim Jordan with three guiding principles in mind. One, that students will not take themselves seriously unless we who teach them honor and respect them in every practical way that we can. Two, that words can change the world and save our lives. Three, that poetry is the highest art and the most exacting service devoted to our most serious and our most imaginative deployment of verbs and nouns on behalf of whatever and whoever we cherish. Poetry for the People created a community that celebrated human connection, attested to the significance of each person's struggles, and defended the idea that anyone could take the course without any prior writing experience. And Jordan made that idea a reality by creating writing workshops that were accessible and welcoming to writers of all levels. Students in Poetry for the People crafted their own original poems, as well as taught poetry for other university students, high school students, and community members. At the close of each semester, students produced an anthology of poetry, and students showcased their work at community and on-campus um, on campus public poetry readings. The program also brought visiting poets to campus and the surrounding area for readings and lectures. Under Professor Jordan's direction, Poetry for the People expanded to sites at Berkeley High School, Dublin Women's Prison, Glide Memorial Church, Mission Cultural Center, Yerba Buena Center, Center for the Arts, and other community venues. Led by Aya de Leon, Poetry for the People continues to the present day in African American studies here at UC Berkeley. And it also continues in all the colleges and high schools and churches and community centers where P4P alums continue to use Jordan's pedagogy as an inspiration for their own writing workshops. Our two featured poets are part of that broad P4P community. I'm gonna introduce both of them, then they'll each share their poems, and then the three of us will have a conversation about Poetry for the People and June Jordan's creative legacy. Samia Bashir is a poet, writer, librettist, performer, and multimedia poetry maker. Her work has been widely published, performed, installed, printed, screened, experienced, and Oxford comed from Berlin to Dusseldorf, Amsterdam to Accra, Florence to Rome, and across the United States. Sometimes she makes poems of dirt, sometimes zeros and ones, sometimes variously rendered text, sometimes light. Bashir is the author of three poetry collections, most recently Field Theories, winner of the 2018 Oregon Book Awards Stafford Hall Award for Poetry. She also received the 2011 Aquarius Press Legacy Award, given annually in recognition of women writers of color who actively provide creative opportunities for other writers. Bashir is an associate professor of creative writing at Reed College, where she teaches poetry and creative nonfiction. Professor Bashir holds a BA from the University of California, Berkeley, where she was part of the Poetry for the People program, and an MFA from the University of Michigan, where she re received two Hopwood Poetry Awards. She is the recipient of numerous grants, fellowships, residencies, prizes, and is a founding organizer of Fire and Inc., an advocacy organization and writers festival for LGBT writers of African descent. 
Born in Istanbul to Iranian parents, Solma Sharif is the author of Look, a finalist for the National Book Award. She holds degrees from UC Berkeley, where she studied and taught with June Jordan's Poetry for the People and NYU. Her work has appeared in Harper's, The Paris Review, Poetry, The Kenyon Review, The New York Times, and other venues. She has been recognized with the Discovery Boston Review Poetry Prize, a Rona Jaffe Foundation Writers Award, and a Holmes National Poetry Prize from Princeton. She has also received fellowships from the National Endowment for the Arts, the Lannan Foundation, and Stanford University. She is currently an assistant professor in creative writing at Arizona State University, where she is inaugurating a Poetry for the People program. Professor Sharif's second poetry collection, Customs, will be published by Grey Wolf Press in March. I'm so looking forward to that, Salma. So excited to see that new book. So a big welcome back to Virtual Cal to both of you. And it's now my pleasure to turn over the mic to Samia Bashir. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm really grateful to be here. Um, I'm going to just begin in poems. And then we'll move around from there. Uh, how not to stay unshot in the USA. Eat garlic. Go to elementary school, attend a country music festival, see a pop star sing, go to the movies, teach creative writing, play loud music on car speakers, but black. Attend middle school, ask someone about the loud music coming from their car speakers, but be black, swim, but be black, lay about a pool, not swimming, but being black, be black. Shop, be white. Hunt. Be not white. Ride your bike. Be at home. Be in high school. Be from the States. Be from anywhere else. Go to Temple. Play outside. Play inside. Have a gun. Have Bible study. Don't have a gun. Join the army. Have a party. Be gay. Be straight. Go to work. Watch football. Have waffles where they have a house. Make social media basically be anywhere near an airport. Visit the mall, chill at the bar, go to the beach, play in the playground, be pregnant and maybe wanna not be pregnant. Go to sleep in your own damn bed. Stop for gas, get groceries, go to church, be a veteran, be a nurse, be a college student, take a spa day, sightsee, air travel, serve an order of protection, Join the Navy, play Santa, sit Shabbat, stop to get a coffee. Be a journalist, live on the streets, call the police in an emergency, work in civil service, wait for a bus, take the bus, die, thus making someone sad. Be mad, parent, be parented, be alone, have a family, watch TV with your family. Break up with someone, take an Uber, teach in any school, anywhere, answer your front door, knock on someone else's front door, be maybe just a little bit crazy, no harm. Be a Marine, make newspapers, be someone's girlfriend, help. Go to graduate school, dance at the club, go to the bank, write, read, but outside. Be taken hostage, which used to be kind of safe. Go to court, be someone's wife, deliver packages and or food, be a neighbor, roam your neighborhood, need your neighbor, attend a workplace training, Congress, have either walls or doors, be a sport, drive a car, eat pancakes while sitting in their very own international house, be a refugee, having escaped getting shot somewhere else, Check out a library book, pause at a rest stop, hoping to rest. National intelligence, be a doctor, go to a park, take a train, attend mosque, be a cop, please stop. Immigrate, have or be an in-law, walk across campus, protest, sell cars, make chill, share some froyo, Speak whatever language you want to speak. 
walk down the street, any street, want some chicken, be a secretary, stay in a hotel, be a patient, live on the reservation, stay in a dormitory, handle your post office business, run for office, homecoming, be in a parking lot, fish in the river by the road, find yourself in desperate need of help, find yourself in desperate need of help, eat ice cream, live in an apartment, take the kids to a pizza shop run by a giant mouse, live off the reservation, seek custody of your children, go to law school, crave chow mein, trade stocks, say, ma'am, this is a Wendy's because you are in fact indeed at a Wendy's, anchor television news, date like anyone really, marry like anyone really, run out of gas, have a child, be a child, live in a house, love a child. Jim Jordan wrote a poem called Kissing God Goodbye, or Who's in Charge? I'm gonna share it with us. I feel like I also need to bring her into the room. I, I've been following this series, and again, thank you so much, Chairman, Nikki, and the whole crew, Black Studies, ADI. Solmaz, I'm so excited to hear you. Um, but yeah, I was fortunate beyond fortunate enough to work with Barbara Christian and June Jordan at the same time, um, which as you can imagine changed my life. Poem in the face of Operation Rescue, which because this poem is copyright 1994 and because in 2022, you mean to tell me on the 12th day or the 13th that the Lord which is to say some wise ass got more muscle than he reasonably can control or figure out some accidental hard disk thunderbolt, some big mouth woman hating, super heterosexist, heterosexual kind of guy guy. He decided who could live and who would die. And after he did what? Created alleyways of death and acid rain and infant mortality rates and sons of the gun and something called the kitchenette and trailer trucks to kill and carry beautiful trees out of their natural habitat. Oh, not that guy. Was it that other guy who invented a snake, an apple and a really retarded scenario so that down to this very day, it is not a lot of fun to give birth to a son of a gun. There wasn't a woman in the picture of the Lord. He done the whole thing by himself the oceans and the skies, the fish that swim and the bird that flies. You sure he didn't have some serious problems of perspective? For example, coming up with mountains, valleys, rivers, rainbows, and no companionship, no coach, no midwife, boyfriend, girlfriend, no help whatsoever for a swollen, overactive brain unable to spell sex? You mean to tell me that the planet is the brainchild of a single male head of household. And after everything he said and done, the floods, famines, plagues, and pestilence, the invention of the slave and the invention of the gun, the worship of war, especially whichever war he won. And after everything he thought about and made 2 million mega pronouncements about like, give me your strength, give, give not your strength to women and you shall not lie with a male as with a woman and an outsider shall not eat of a holy thing. And if a woman conceives and bears a male child then she shall be unclean seven days. But if she bears a female child then she shall be unclean two weeks. And the leper who has the disease shall wear torn clothes and let the hair of his head hang loose and he shall cover his upper lip and cry unclean, unclean. And behold, I have two daughters who have not known man. Let me bring them out to you and do to them as you please. And I will greatly multiply your pain in childbearing in pain, you shall bring forth children and take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering. And in the middle of this lunatic lottery, there was Ruth saying to Naomi, entreat me not to leave you or to return from following you. For where you go, I will go. And where you lodge, your people shall be my people and your God, my God, where you die, I will die and there I will be buried. 
May the Lord do so to me and more also if even death parts me from you. And David wailing aloud at the death of Jonathan who loved him more than his own soul and David inconsolable in lamentation saying, very pleasant you have been to me. Your love to me was wonderful, passing the love of women. And if I give away all I have, if I, if I deliver my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. And this chaos, this chaos exploded tyrannical and scattershot, scattershot scripture, like those who belong in Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desire and cast out the slave and her son. And in spite of this, you will not hearken to me. Then you shall eat the flesh of your sons and you shall eat the flesh of your daughters. And I will destroy your high places and I will lay your cities waste. I will devastate the land and for those of yours that are left, I will send faintness into their hearts and the lands of their enemies. The sound of a driven leaf shall put them to flight, et cetera, et cetera. That guy, that guy, the ruler of all earth and heaven too, the maker of all laws and all taboo, the absolute supremacist of power, <laughs> the origin of destiny of molecules and Mars, the father and the son, the king and the prince, the prophet and the prophecy, the singer and the song, the man from whom, in whom, with whom, of whom, by whom comes everything without the womb, without that unclean feminine connection, that guy, the emperor of poverty, the czar of suffering, the wizard of disease, the joker of morality, the force of rape, the pioneer of slavery, the priest of sexuality, the host of violence, the almighty font of fear and trembling. That's the guy. You mean to tell me on the 12th day or the 13th that the Lord, which is to say some wise ass, got more muscle than he reasonably can control or figure out some accidental hard disk, thunderbolt, some big mouth, woman hating, super heterosexist, heterosexual kind of guy guy. He decided who could live and who would die. And so the names become the names of the living, of the dead and the living who love Peter, John, Teddy, Phil, Larry, Bob, Alan, Richard, Tom, Wayne, David, Jonathan, Bruce, Mike, Steve. And so our names become the names of the dead and the living who love Suzanne, Amy, Elizabeth, Margaret, Trudy, Linda, Sarah, Alexis, Francis, Nancy, Ruth, Naomi, Julie, Kate, Patricia. And out of that scriptural scattershot, our names become the names of the dead. Our names become the names of the iniquitous, the names of the accursed, the names of the tribes of the abomination, because my name is not Abraham. My name is not Moses, Leviticus, Solomon, Cain, or Abel. My name is not Matthew, Luke, Saul, or Paul. My name is not Adam. My name is female. My name is freedom. My name is the one who lives outside the tent of her father. My name is the one who is dark. My name is the one who fights for the end of the kingdom. My name is the one at home. My name is the one who bleeds. My name is the one with the womb. My name is female. My name is freedom. My name is the one the Bible despised. My name is the one astrology cannot predict. My name is the name I am learning to preach to the world. My name is the name that the law cannot invalidate. My name is the name is the one who loves. And that guy, that guy, you never even seen up close. He cannot eat at my table. He cannot sleep in my bed. He cannot push me aside. He cannot make me commit or contemplate suicide. He cannot say my name without shame. He cannot say my name, my name. My name is the name of the one who loves. And he has no dominion over me. And his hate has no dominion over me. I am she who will be free. And that guy better not try to tell anybody about who should live and who should die or why. His name is not holy. He is not my Lord. He is not my people. His name is not sacred. His name is not my name. His name is not the name of those who love the living. His name is not the name of those who love the living and the dead. His name is not our name who survived the death of men and women whose beloved breath becomes at last our own. Here's the thing. 
things fall apart. I'm sort of sleeping then I am on fire, undone, burned, stripped of skin. I feel so raw these days, flattened, full of doubt, numb. Rats thrive in sewers, so maybe I'm thriving. It may seem simple enough, but my dreams don't say so. This I think I know. No one notices me. Lost, alone, blind as a sewer rat six feet back. Gelatinous, raw as a baby rat, shook, underdone, two full rats still hungry, rich rat, swimming, sewage, baseline rat, breadline rat, baker rat, transformed, stuck in a well driving, burned into brick road, milepost, sign. Triumphant, I scream, but words burn like sky fire. Clammy, street rat, fell in a hole, stuck in a well. I rattle the cages of our children. Everywhere else is empty. I am fluent in fire fluent in indigo miseries. I am fluent in the absence of heat, a rat on the street, sudden and melt. I am fluent in how time presses a body. Here's the thing I'm not supposed to say. I saw others skulk the dark like me, simple enough. I skulk away a little more each day. Maybe there's intelligent life but I'm not in. How will we survive and to survive this having a body, trying to be intelligent life, fireball struck and stuck. I study the crows who know this having a body to fly. Almost a dream, a sign you're not supposed to notice, a path, who can I be? Blame the apocalypse, it, it's melt. It bends, it never ends. Thing is, things fall apart. I'm not saying I'm a prophet, but I know the meaning of a moment like ours, burning. I'm almost sure I'm here, transformed, torn apart, average, boring, humdrum, no sound stays innocent, numb. Every day, the end of the world is now again. Normal, I burn and remember having a body, how it feels, cold. If I hold no beauty in this slapdash world, then tuck me away from the heat of the day. Alone, I burn. Blame the humdrum numbness of the end of the world. I listen for the wind. I listen, intelligent life, where is it? No sound in innocent means, root, way. I am not saying I'm a prophet, but I always travel slightly singed, pressed by time. Six feet back, I find the me whose tall is a gum tree. The me with copper hair, causeway me, opening, expanse, eyes open, heart full of doubt. I strike my fireballs and burn, sort of dreaming. Now volcano, now oil slicked river, stripped of skin, fluent in the press of time, body clammed, voice raw and syrup stripped, eyes open, sewer rat, thriving. No sound stays innocent. Rats, footpath, corridor, clearing, and yes, the bushes burn like sky fire and I decide to survive. Claim every sunrise. I am dark as earth. So I am now I am me with the bright yellow hair, me with the normal girth. Wait, normal? Do I know that word? Did I ever? Is it normal to hang from a tree? Is normal an ability to breathe? Are normal these panic attacks? Does normal stand whole bodies back, tucked away from the heat of the day? Listen for how to survive this body, face twisted, slightly singed, fueled by my own crisped flames, condemned. I know the meaning of a moment, but here's the thing. 
Am I intelligent life? How would I know? How could I tell? The crows know. I know I'm not road, I'm doorway. And when things fall apart again, I'll be here my rectangular shade of blue. I'm not supposed to talk about transformation though. Not the me with the hollow cheeks. The me with the blood red stride fluent in the need to dance. Me with moles in 14 places here, having a body. Me with three nose rings, normal. I grasp for a branch, normal. Me with the war wounds, I thrive. Gutter rat, the burning quiet of stars. Who else can I be? I'm going to close, I think. Some days of wine and pastry. Oh, I wanted to share all pretty new things, so we're going to live in that P4P in progress. Right blah, 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 there was a plague. Again. Listen, I'm too old to have lived through so much pestilence already, but grandmother called it better than the, better than the alternative to live. You'd never know that so many of us do, despite ourselves. Everyone has a story. And when June asked us what we should do, those of us who did not die, I can only imagine what she'd say if I answered, lie around drunk and bake bread, make cookies, and never quite spread the too tight space that crushes us, too. Put my foot in the grass, press toward grounding, pull back flesh like hot ice on the boiled side of melt. It was cold, it was hot, it blazed, and that was before the plague, again, ran across our viral land. Everywhere, people with all the anger, all the guns feel outnumbered. Listen, they are. I guess he did promise to build a wall. I guess we're just supposed to talk about all this bullshit now. But the leaves this autumn, how they too flaunt their flames deep into December like they know how fast we forget our own spilled blood. The canopy is me. See how I hover, how I don't so much block light as scatter it, how I kitten yarn batter it. When I come back around to meet myself, what will I say? Will I just assume I can swim until the current pulls me down? I guess. As Fauvier would say, if for just one day we didn't have to earn, if for just one day, then who do we want to become? Browning and greening in the wetness of the recent rains, the way they set everything alight, the untoward way the raindrops flash to prick its bit of waning sunlight. Four, that feeling when you know horrible things happen, but you can't remember them. That feeling when you remember horrible thing after horrible thing and still you think, nope, that's not the one. That feeling when there's nothing left but feeling, no thought, just paralysis and feeling. That feeling when there's nothing left to feel and nothing in the lap for breakfast. So it turns out I'm allergic to society as a whole. When in doubt, they say, go back in time. I mean, whiteness, I guess. When I wanna feel safe, I figure I should want something else. Everywhere I go, everyone I see could be a shooter. It's stressful. There you start. My breasts don't fit into bulletproof vests, so. Six. Tomorrow is another country. Even here, the philosopher's stone ain't stone. Bottoms out unexpectedly. Tomorrow is not another country. Tomorrow is not even there. I can't forget waters while I drown. So why does this silence engulf unseen and unsmelled? Seven. This did not happen here. 
we insist through all the happening. Eight, maybe this quiet is a stop. Our outer space treaties are older now than my whole generation, just as outdated, just as orbited by garbage and left to rot from our every epizootic breath. It is, our leaders <laughs> say, what it is. Nine. In Rome, I had a red feather bow. I tickle your nose with my loosey goosey feathers. I ruled the stage, honey. Now it's long gone. Thank you. Wow. Wow, wow, thank you. I start right, right with June, a poem for a young poet dedicated to Irwin Cho Woods, May 27th, 1997. Most people search all of their lives for some place to belong to, as you said. But I look instead into the eyes of anyone who talks to me. I search for a face to believe and belong to, a loosening mask with a voice, ears, and a consciousness breathing through a nose I can see. Day to day, it's the only way I like to travel, noticing the colors of a cheek, the curvature of brow and the public declarations of two lips. Okay, I did not say male or female. I did not say Serbian or Tutsi. I said, what turns, what tilts my head into the opposite of fear or dread is anyone who talks to me. A face to claim or question my next step away or else towards. 15 anemones dilated well beyond apologies for such an open centerpiece that soft forever begs for bees. One morning and the bird song and the dew struck honeysuckle blending invitations to dislodge my fingers tangling with my sunlit lover's hair. A face to spur or interdict my mesmerized approach or else my agonized reproach to strangulations of the soul that bring a mother to disown her children, leaving them alone to feel, feed on bone and dust. A face despite a corpse invasion of the cradle where I rock my love alive. A face despite numb fashions of an internet connection between nobody and no one. A face against the narcoleptic antiseptic chalk streaks in the sky that lie and posit credit cards and starch de facto exposés as copacetic evidence that you and I need no defense against latrine and bully bulletproof decisions launched by limousines dividing up the big screen into gold points cold above the, uh, above the valley of the shadow of unpardonable tiny, 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 this breathing and that breath and then that and that, that death. I search a face, a loosening mask with voice, ears, and a consciousness breathing through a nose that I can see. I search a face for obstacles to genocide. I search beyond the dead and driven by imperfect visions of the living, yes and no. I come and go back to the eyes of anyone who talks to me. Thank you so much to um, Dr. Jones and Dr. Elliot and, and the African American Studies Department at Cal for having me here today. It's such, it's such an honor. It's such an honor to be back, um, to be able to celebrate June Jordan and think of her work. Um, and really, I think I'm just gonna read a few poems of mine and, and a few of hers and move back and forth in between and, and leave as much time as possible for, for conversation. Um, but I'm thinking of faces. And I wasn't planning on reading this poem, but um, the world, I don't know. The poem is called Look, um, and it's the title poem of my first collection. And the US Department of Defense has its own dictionary. And in it, they redefine the word look to mean and mind warfare, the, the period during which a mind circuit is receptive of an influence. So look. 
It matters what you call a thing. Exquisite, a lover called me, exquisite. Whereas, well, if I were from your culture living in this country, said the man outside the 2004 Republican National Convention, I would put up with that for this country. Whereas I felt the need to clarify, you would put up with torture, you mean, and he proclaimed yes. Whereas what is your life? Whereas years after they look down from their jets and declare my mother's Abaddon block probably destroyed. We walked by the villas, the faces of buildings torn off into dioramas and recorded it on a handheld camcorder. Whereas it could take as long as 16 seconds between the trigger pulled in Las Vegas and the hellfire missile landing in Mazar Sharif, after which they will ask, did we hit a child? No, a dog, they will answer themselves. Whereas the federal judge at the sentencing hearing said, I want to make sure I, I'm pronouncing the defendant's name correctly. Whereas this lover would pronounce my name and call me exquisite and lay the floor lamp across the floor, softening even the light. Whereas the lover made my heat rise, rise so that if heat sensors were trained on me, they could read my thermal shadow through the roof and through the wardrobe. Whereas it's not like seeing a dead body walking to the grocery store here. It's not like that. It's a rock, you know, it's a rock. It's kind of like acceptable to see that there and not. It was kind of like seeing a dead dog or a dead cat lying. Whereas I thought if you would look at my exquisite face or my father's, he would reconsider. Whereas, you mean I should be disappeared because of my family name? And he answered, yes, that's exactly what I mean, adding that his wife helped draft the Patriot Act. Whereas the federal judge wanted to be sure he was pronouncing the defendant's name correctly and said he had read all the exhibits, which included the letter I wrote to cast the defendant in a loving light. Whereas today we celebrate things like his transfer to a detention center closer to home. Whereas his son has moved across the country. Whereas I made nothing happen. Whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow for what is your life. It is even a thermal shadow it appears so little and then vanishes from the screen. Whereas I cannot control my own heat and it can take as long as 16 seconds between the trigger, the hellfire missile and a dog, they will answer themselves. Whereas a dog, they will say, now, therefore, let it matter what we call a thing. Let it be the exquisite face for at least 16 seconds. Let me look at you. Let me look at you in a light that takes years to get here. June again. Poem about police violence. Tell me something. What you think would happen if every time they kill a black boy, then we kill a cop. Every time they kill a black man, then we kill a cop. Do you think the accident rate would lower subsequently? Sometimes the feeling like amaze me baby comes back to my mouth and I'm quiet like Olympian pools from the running, the mountainous snows under the sun. Sometimes thinking about the 12th house of the cosmos or the way your ear ensnares the tip of my tongue or signs that I never, I have never seen like danger, women working. I lose consciousness of ugly, bestial, rabid and repetitive affront as when they tell me 18 cops in order to subdue one man. 18 strangled him to death in the ensuing scuffle. Don't you idolize the diction of the powerful? subdue and scuffle, my oh my. And that the murder, that the killing of Arthur Miller on a Brooklyn street was a justifiable accident again, again. People have been having accidents all over the globe so long that I reckon that the only su suitable insurance is a gun. I'm saying war is not to understand or rerun. War is to be fought and won. Sometimes the feeling like amaze me, baby. Blots it out, the beast seal, but not too often. Tell me something. What you think would happen if every time they kill a black boy, then we kill a cop? Every time they kill a black man, then we kill a cop. You think the accident rate would lower subsequently?
for my new book, which is coming out tomorrow officially. Social skills training. Studies suggest, how may I help you officer, is the single most disarming thing to say and not what's the problem. Studies suggest it's best to help reply my pleasure and not no problem. Studies suggest it's best not to mention problem in front of power, even to say there is none. Gloria Steinem says women lose power as they age and yet the loudest voice in my head is my mother. Studies show the mother we have in mind isn't the mother that exists. Mine says, what the fuck are you crying for? Studies show the baby monkey will pick the fake monkey with fake fur over the furless wire monkey with milk without contest. Studies show to negate a thing is to think it anyway. I'm not sad. I'm not sad. Studies recommend regular expressions of gratitude and internal check-ins. Enough, the wire mother says. History is a kind of study. History says we forgave the executioner. Before we mopped the blood, we asked, Lord judge, have I executed well? Studies suggest, yes. What the fuck are you crying for, officer? The wire mother teaches me to say. While studies suggest, Salmaz, have you thanked your executioner today? You know, I um, I studied with Poetry for the People uh, from the spring of 2002 through uh, 2006. And it happened because I searched the schedule of courses, I searched the word poetry, and uh, the first course that came up was this course called Poetry for the People. It was being taught by someone named June Jordan and it was in the African-American studies department, 156 AC. And uh, all these words sounded like exactly where I wanted to be. And, and then I, I had only read one, one poem of June's, which is a, a poem that is uh, called uh, Taiko Dojo for Haruko. Um, and I remember, uh, and it's just the word no kind of repeated uh, in, this, in this percussive way. I remember being really um, confused by the poem when I saw it. I was 16 and uh, it was in an anthology. And uh, I remember that uh, I read other poems in that anthology and that I forgot them all, you know? That was the only one that kind of stuck with me. Um, even as like a curiosity or an irritant of not quite getting it or not knowing what I was supposed to be hearing. Um, and when I came into class that spring, um, June wasn't there. Uh, it was being directed by a man by the name of Junichi Samitsu. And uh, we were told that June might come next week, you know, um, to give a guest lecture. But anyway, she's on medical leave. And, uh, and then the next week came and went and it came and went and, and week by week, it, it kind of, you know, it went on like that. And then on the very last uh, uh, day of our, of our final reading, our big final reading, um, uh, June was still not there and she requested this poem be read in her absence. And so I think I will close with it, but I also wanna say um, what a particular honor and joy it is to be here with Samia today because, uh, you know, one of the great gifts for me of Poetry for the People was having like real live living poets next to me and working alongside me or ahead of me, you know, and, um, and, uh, and her name, you know, was a constant in our classrooms. And so I never studied with June. I studied with her students and I studied her work on my own and, and uh, my correspondence with her continues in that way. And I know that I'm not alone in that. Um, so I'll close, I guess, with this final poem that she asked to be read, which I always found so moving to think, you know, if you, looking back on decades, you know, of work, this, this prolific um, writer and, and scholar and thinker, um, what do you pick? Um, and for the P4P group, she picked this poem. It's called On a New Year's Eve. Infinity doesn't interest me, not altogether anymore. I crawl and kneel and grub about. I beg and listen for what can go away as easily as love. 
or perish like the children running hard on one-way streets. Infinity doesn't interest me, not anymore. Not even repetition, your, my, eyelid, or the colorings of sunrise, where all the sky excitement added up is not enough to satisfy this lusting adulation I, that I feel for your brown arm before it moves, moves, changes up the temporary sacred tales ago, first bike ride around the house when you first saw a squat opossum carry babies on her back, a possum up, in the persimmon tree, you reeling toward that natural first absurdity with so much wonder still it shakes your voice. The temporary is the sacred takes me out. And even the stars and even the snow and even the rain do not amount to much unless these things submit to some disturbance, some derangement such as when I yield myself belonging to your unmistaken body and let the powerful lock up the canyon mountain peaks, the hidden rivers, waterfalls, the deep down minerals, the coal fields, gold fields, diamond mines, close by the whoring ore, hot at the center of the earth, spinning fast as numbers I cannot imagine. Let the world blot, obliterate, remove so-called magnificence, so-called almighty, fathomless, and ev everlasting treasures, wealth, whatever that may be. It is this time that matters. It is this history I care about, the one we make together, awkward, inconsistent as a lame cat on the loose, or quick as kids freed by the bell, or else as strictly once as only life must mean a once upon a time. I have rejected propaganda teaching me about the beautiful, the truly rare, supposedly the soft push of the ocean at the hush point of the shore, supposedly the soft push of the ocean at the hush point of the shore is beautiful, for instance, but the truly rare can stay out there. I have rejected that abstraction, that enormity, unless I see a dog walk on the beach, a bird sees sand flies, or yourself approach me, laughing out a sound to spoil the pretty picture, make an uncontrolled heart beating memory instead. I read the papers preaching on that oil and oxygen, that redwoods and the evergreens that trees, the waters, and the atmosphere compile a final listing of the world in short supply, but all alive and all the lives persist perpetual in jeopardy, persist as scarce as every one of us, as difficult to find or keep, as irreplaceable, as frail as every one of us. And as I watch your arm, your brown arm, just before it moves, I know all things are dear that disappear. All things are dear that disappear. Thank you. Oh my gosh. Um, I just feel so incredibly just overwhelmed and just honored, honored to get to be in this space with you, honored to be in the space with the audience. I don't know if y'all were able were following the chat as you were reading. Um, so much love coming to both of you. Um, audience members, hey, send questions via the Q&A function um, so I can ask these fabulous poets what you want to hear them talk about. Um, let me kick off the Q&A with this one. Uh, this is for both of you that, that, um, that responds to this. Um, so both of you were lucky enough to be part of June Jordan's Poetry for the People program when you were undergrads here at Cal. Um, what was learning in P4P like? And what's something that you remember vividly from that experience? Samia, do you want to go first since Salma's already sort of started sharing a little bit about this? Unmute, there we go, hi. Yeah, um, I mean, I think too about how or what that June Jordan is why I was at Berkeley, uh, I heard her read a poem. Some I, I, uh, Prime of Parma's A Place of Rage. And this was 1992. And we were in the middle of riots in LA. And I was, I figured I was going to go to UCLA or something. But then I had to, this poet changed everything. And what was it like to learn with her, to teach with her, to, I mean, it was a nonstop. Uh, I feel like climbing up the steps of the Rose Garden, 
Mm-hmm. You know, like it's sunny and freaking gorgeous and you're surrounded by roses and you're climbing though and you're climbing. You're getting stronger as you're climbing and you're climbing and you're climbing and you're reaching back and you're grabbing people and you're pulling people up and you're surrounded by roses and it's beautiful out and a little too hot after a few steps, but then, you know, you get some water. (laughs) Yeah, it was very um, challenging and nourishing and exciting and, you know, filled with aroma. (laughs) I love that. I love that so much. So Maz, you want to share a pee for pee? I love that image too. And I, and, um, you know, I think, uh, I think of, uh, Bernice Johnson Reagan's essay on coalitional spaces and coalitional politics. And there's the line, there's a line where she says, you feel like you might keel over and die at any moment if you're if you're doing it right and there's this way that 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 space was um so uh, incredibly alive with possibility and change and commitment that it required the very best and most open like ness and vulnerable like ness of all of us um in ways that you know I thought, I thought it would just be a given that then I would get to go out into the world and, and that's what it would be like everywhere, you know? Um, I thought it was just gonna be rose gardens and, and that climb, the difficulty of the climb, right? But um, coming out, I see how incredibly rare it was and how the, the fear of it, in fact, right? Like the threat of it, which is, which is real, but then the, the, the threat being read as, a, as such a mortal danger that we should avoid it um, really kind of forecloses that space from existing in so many other in so many other ways and places. And so, you know, um, there's that. And then there's also the fact that like, I almost, I was just so terrified of workshop and, and I was just so terrified of every, every step of the way. And, and I almost dropped out. I almost dropped the course. Uh, I just stopped showing up and it was my student teacher, poet, Marcos Ramirez, who called me and, and I can't, I had an answering machine in my dorm room you know, it was like blinking and I pl- press play and, and my STP was asking me like where I was, you know, I thought I was in trouble, but, um, but he just wanted to make sure that I come back and I read a poem, you know, and, and that's also a really rare thing. And I, I don't know what my life would have been like if he hadn't made that phone call, you know, um, and, and p for ps really wanted a series of those interventions upon my life. And I know many others as well. There's a question in the Q&A about teaching. Um, both of you, in addition to you know being poets, are also professional teachers. Um, so one of our audience members wants to know, um, how has studying June Jordan's work changed the way you teach now? I know it's a big question. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think... I mean, I think poetry for, for the people has always informed my teaching. It's, you know, it began my teaching and, uh, 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 you know, teaching, doing the student teacher poet, teaching in the schools and, the, you know, in the streets and all of the places that we went. And, and then when I graduated, that's what I did. And I kept doing that for years. And, and when I moved into academia, there's something about the need for openness, the need for more than, this is not just you're going to class and maybe you're writing a poem. Like the, it's, it's, it's an engagement. Like we have to do readings. We have to make things. We have to work together. Um, we have to rely on each other. We have to press each other. Um, we have to congratulate each other. We have to build something, um, all, you know, and we have to respond to each other and, and, and to the world. <laughs> uh, and so that's, that's just the baseline. How about you, Thomas? I mean, especially as you're yeah. just start a new iteration of poetry for the people at Arizona State. Right. Yeah. No, I mean, like some, yeah, I think, I mean, it's affected my teaching in any, any classroom, any workshop, any, any space I, I kind of enter. And, uh, and a lot of it actually goes back to one of the lines that Sami also quoted about like, you know, what shall we do? We who did not die, right? Some of us did not die and, you know, let's get on with it, right? So, um, and having that sense of, of uh, 
urgency and precarity and any any kind of shared space or any and behind any speech act really um, has been central to my to my work and to my teaching um, and uh, and I think it's 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 also been central it's been fascinating to watch those of us who have gone out you know and aren't necessarily teaching or aren't necessarily you know writing in these public facing ways or whatever but like are practicing so many of these these modes and values and principles in in whatever fields and and lives that we find ourselves in and so that that is another thing that's kind of affected my teaching right like poetry means taking control of the language of your life as june jordan said right and and then and beyond that it's it's what will you do you know with the language of your life wherever you find yourself I have, there's, there's so many amazing questions that are just, folks are, folks are really like resonating with the things you're saying. So uh, a question from um, a former GSI for P4P, who actually was, was um, connecting in with what you just said, Soma, is about vulnerability, right? Um, wonders about um, how you've brought that part of the pedagogy from P4P into your own classrooms for both of you, vulnerability, like what, what does that look like in practice? Hmm. You want to start so much? So, what's that? Uh, I can't, all of a sudden I'm blanking. I mean, it looks like so many things, you know, it looks like so many things for me. So I'm still thinking, Samia, so, yeah, if you, if you want to go. Well, I think um, I think it, it it there's a kind of terror <laughs> that has to be acknowledged first, and also like seventeenth, I think, right? Like, there's a space where I mean, in one of the poems, when I when I want some safety, I, I think I might need to want something else, and I might need to want that in in. Po studying poetry and making poet, there's a way that you have to kind of crack things open uh, mm -hmm. uh, that aren't always, I mean, you know, that aren't always not messy. You get egg yolk everywhere, mm -hmm. whatever. It is. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and to be clear about that from the very beginning, um, especially when and where you're in atmospheres where that is, is unexpected or less encounter to just be like this is we're walking into you've walked through the tree we're in a different place right now and um and a lot can go down and we need to create space that's like the pedagogy of care like this is our circle of care i actually have that one of those quotes from june at the top of my my intro syllabus just about every year um that's what we're doing here and so not only can anything happen but we have to round up and love on it mm. Yeah, I'm sorry. It'll be hard. Yeah, absolutely. And I and you know I was thinking I was think I I realized a specific thing or or I'm thinking of like a specific way that this kind of plays out and and it's this constant uh, in my case request for greater specificity actually right there's this you know um, June so much of June's June's work and and the teaching of poetry for the people is about moving beyond the kind of like surface level abstract abstractions or abstract nouns that govern our lives and trying to name more concretely what we need right and that might be a noun even like war or colonialism or it might be a noun like silence or love or whatever it might be these these kinds of words that we we um look toward when we're first writing poems maybe um and and with that greater specificity there is a greater vulnerability, right? Because you are naming more and more clearly uh, in a way that you and only you can kind of singularly stand behind what you just said, right? You, you've abandoned the shelter of like, of whatever, you know, uh, decolonial might mean, right? And then you're standing within, within your own kind of ecosystem of imagery or of music often too. Um, and there's a great vulnerability in that. That's such a really um, uh, great 
image for that cracking open to like it's like you could think like oh i mean something so metaphysical but also this is both i mean the word right like the word language what that means for you like breaking i mean i feel like we had a conversation about beauty and just like mm -hmm. oh you wrote that word there but what does that mean like and and let's do we have to deal with the fact that that does not mean the same thing to probably anyone in this room and you know so then what's the word under that what's what do you really actually mean and to have to kind of dig into that space just at the late level of language then everything else that the poem is bringing i think is really an important clarity of that mm -hmm. I feel like both of those things that you both said have answered another question, a set of questions that are in the chat. It's about um, how do you encourage emerging poets to speak their truth when we live in times where certain truths are not supported through traditional roots? Um, how do we protect ourselves and also the poets who continue in the wake and legacy of work like Jordan's poem about police violence? Um, I have a, a question I want to sort of piggyback on that and ask a question about, uh, also another question about pedagogical values. So one of the core pedagogical values that Professor Jordan championed in P4P was beloved community, right? Inspired by Martin Luther King Jr.'s use of that term. So what I'm wondering is um, what does beloved community mean to both of you? Central to it would be a kind of radical and rigorous honesty um, toward each other. Um, Beloved community is not necessary. Does not necessarily, in, in to my mind or reading, feel um, comfortable all the time, right? Um, but, but it does feel, feel loving. That that real love, you know, real love reveals the lover, right, to themselves, right. Um, the accuracy and the truth of that, of that kind of reckoning across each other and with each other can again feel threatening, can feel like you might keel over and die, all of those things. Um, and a lot of it is, yes, arrived at through that kind of specificity, through coming back in, in Poetry for the People's case, like to the language that we're using to describe, to make sure we're saying what we mean, to make sure we know what we mean to say, and then, and then once we've gotten that right, to to talk around that and make sure that 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 is like, you know, um, as loving as it could be, you know, which is kind of a rare conversation I'd say uh, in other workshops. And then, yeah, it's critical. I mean, I think the the they that love part, like I mean, really literally, but you know, again, saying it not because Pollyanna, but like that. It can be really hard. We can get on each other's damn nerves too, you know. And also to like enter that space and not just provide that vulnerability, but to open it and to know that like I'm bearing my soul and what I have to also be open to the possibility that I might be wrong. Like to my, I suddenly might realize I don't even agree with my damn self. What did that do to how I even existed or moved through the world? Like. Um, and in front of everybody. And uh, <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, if, you, if we can't like actually have to interrogate whatever it means for us to bring and show up lovingly there. And, and I just mean that like, you know, whatever, when you go outside, be nice to each other, but don't bring me involved in it. But like <laughs> right here, what this is and ideally outside, because I'm gonna make you all work with each other like the whole time. Um, you have to learn how to like, you know, be uncomfortable and be like, yeah. <laughs> so I'm getting a, um, a question in the chat because some folks are having difficulty with the Q and A. If that's you, go ahead and post in the chat. I'm going to, I'm going to toggle and look at both of these. Um, so here, here's the question. Um, I hear across today's readings today, a confrontation with state violence in the most intimate and public of spaces. How does your work and the work of June Jordan speak to the contemporary conversation on abolition? Um, 
Well, I'll say that's a big question because I think, <laughs> I mean, before I think about my work, I, I can't uh, even imagine June's work without abolition. Um, I think there's, it's, there's something that's not even about a given, but an insistence. Mm -hmm. So much does that make sense? Yeah. Do you feel? Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, I, um, I return to that, the poem about police violence often, and I, and I think about it often and, and the kind of obvious connection between that poem and, and my work is, is the, is the moment where she's, she's questioning the language of the powerful. Um, but the other thing is, is, you know, this feeling I have of like, I can't believe she just said that. You know, I mean, like, how dangerous is it to actually say that, right? And like, what is that courage, you know? Um, and who's saying that right now, right? Um, so that, in, the insistence, right, there, too. Um, to say the thing and the, out loud. Where's that? To say the thing and name it again and again, yeah. Again and again, right, repeatedly. And then within it, too, have like these, like, have flights of felicity and let the music come in and like enjoy yourself too, right? So it's not just like argument, 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 ar you know, it's like these things, these things so long as, as uh, structurally they cannot be kind of disentangled so long as like, you know, uh, a poem like poem about my rights must be, must be written, right? There's no other way to just move through my day. Um, I will move, I will move, you know, with pleasure, with sensual pleasure, and pleasure in language and in music within and it also, you know, and I think that that is the other part of her work and, and assist upon that, right, you know? And what like space, like, you know, how much is she, how much is she cracking open for all of us? There was an earlier question about like protection or how to protect ourselves. Like, I don't know how to answer that question, to be honest. I don't, to me, I don't know if you, you have like senses around this, but, I don't know that protection is, protection is definitely not a solitary act, I'd say, I don't think. That part. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I think, you know, there's something about protection that I think, you know, one can assume, but also never assume, you know, like there, mm. you know. Like you have to, if you're going to do the thing, you kind of have to do the thing, even if something's horrible um, or not. But, you know, if you're aiding for protection from a super unprotective space, then you're just really kind of just going to be sitting around for a long time. And sometimes you're the one that's creating the protection. I love this because I feel like we're in a bookshop, right? we're doing live exactly what you're saying is the important thing to do. It's like, what do we mean by that word? What mm. do we, let's see if we agree with ourselves. Let's, let's talk through this um, in that spirit, in the Q and a um, from June's former partner, Adrian Torf, who it is an honor to have you here. Um, she asks, did June ask for vulnerability or did she ask for honesty? Honesty. Honesty. In my I defer. Life. Yeah, that was a quick answer. <laughs> <laughs> there is a difference. Well, let me. Um, I want to pivot a little bit to um, thinking about school again. Thinking about these pedagogical spaces, these places where where we're being vulnerable, or we're being honest, or we're being both, or you know, we're thinking about risk, we're thinking about how to encourage other writers, how to be truthful, all of these things, right? Um, and I'm thinking about June Jordan's own memoir, Soldier, A Poet's Childhood. Yeah, right, an amazing, amazing book, right? In it, she described school as a place where she was rewarded for copying and for memorizing things without understanding them, including poems, right? Um, so here's the question for both of you. How did your own childhood experiences, your childhood learning experiences shape the way that you experienced the P4P workshop or poetry learning in general? Hmm. I can't 
be so loud. So I don't know. I, what's that? I was just like, I can't see if we're moving or not. But there, go for it. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I have long pauses between between questions. Um, but um, I, you know, I think that there is. I might regret this answer. That's okay. Um, there's a sense I had of childhood, in childhood, um, and this has to do with like, you know, being Iranian and moving around constantly and being an only child, which is one resonance I had with with June, June and and her memoir and every, like, of like, not being spoken to and not being taken seriously either. You know, like the the things I would say didn't have didn't just kind of like dissipate, you know? And so I stopped, I stopped saying much, right? And, but it's out of that kind of, um, and I found that I had to kind of turn my pitch like further, further away from where I was and further down, down the line, so to speak. Um, and I have all kinds of, you know, structural explanations for this, right? Like what else, what else would happen if, you know, you're the only Iranian kid in like a white school in Birmingham, Alabama, for example, you know, what else would happen if, you know, like all these, all these ways I can kind of understand this. And yet it's that, it's the pressure of that, that speech and the kind of wonder behind it um, that I found also really alive in, in, in June's work. Uh, to be honest, right? And those those moments of kind of felicity or flight in between the, the argument too, I'd say come come from a similar sp space, maybe, you know. How about you, Sabia? Yeah, it's it's interesting. you know, there's so many interwoven answers there. So, you know, my mother was a teacher and and loved language. Um, and I'm glad like so she, I'm very fortunate that she like I had access to poetry from the beginning and uh and my father and language so you know being my mother with her Detroit sound and that family and my father the Somalis it's just like the I just feel like they're batted around like six languages like uh with their heads like a football you know and it was just like being in the back and forth of these spaces all of which were always laced with poetry and Honestly, I feel like by the time I get to like high school, high school like tried to kill. But it's it's one of those things that when we think about the pedagogy that like I took and take with me is that the real like aggravation I have toward the way we teach poetry is like this puzzle you have to solve or this like thing that's really hard and you'll never get it. But you know you can try to get it and you'll get a good break. You know it's like that's not what this is at all. That's, that's not how any of this works. It's, you know it's a a deadening. Um, that, you know, I think June, when I even heard that poem, like broke a lie for me, you know, somebody who's mm -hmm. also grew up in theater, I'm very kind of come from space of performance. And, and, you know, at the time, that's what I was doing. And the way she like brought the language back alive in a way that it had been cut from poetry. I was writing other things. I, I mm -hmm. just, I, the sound of that and, and how much it means I really have to break all that stuff away from teaching. Cause I know my students come, it's just like, it's like the five paragraph essay, but it's like the poem version, <laughs> you know? No, wait, 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 wait. What did you just feel? Like what, did you, where's the, where's the beat kind of dance to it? You know, something. All right, we have time for one final question. So, um, so here's, here's what I, here's what I want to ask y'all. Um, so Maya Angelou, a contemporary of June Jordan's famously wrote that, quote, people will forget what you said and they will forget what you did, but people will never forget the way you made them feel, end quote. Um, how did June, June Jordan or her work make you feel and what's something that you want the rest of us to remember about her? Alive. I mean, yeah, my answer is a lot, like, but like the screeching alive. Um, <laughs> You know, the thing I always insist upon in terms of what to remember about June is that her laugh, her laughter, she had like hmm. the most infectious giggle that like you would ever in your whole life hear. And 
then you're cracking up and then it's, you know, about the silliest things, you know, and yeah, you know, it's just like she could crash you and she was really, you, you could fight and you up and you could agree and disagree and, and, and then she would talk about the randomest things and <laughs> be like, really do you do but really the humor, she was just, her laugh was everything. Mm-hmm. And so then what would I ask everyone to take that, that insistence upon joy and, and not and even saccharinely, but like, no, I mean it, let's, ha, 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 ha. <laughs> uh, alive was the first word that came to mind for me too, you know? Um, and, but also this sense, you know, like I hear the quote and, and hearing it kind of through her, or, you know, I think people will remember. People will remember what you say, though, right? So there's this. I don't know. There's this kind of um, thing of Adrian, you know, drawing the important and necessary distinction between vulnerability and and uh, honesty in the chat, right? So like this con, this like um, constant active questioning and wrestling with what, what is actually being said. And are we sure, it, are we sure it's right? Are we sure it's true before we proceed? Um, and can we get people to remember what we say? Yeah. I love that as the work, right? Um, what a beautiful place to close out this incredible reading and conversation. Um, thank you again to our panelists, Samia Bashir, Salma Sharif. Um, yeah, just a blessing. You two are amazing. Um, thanks to our student organizers, Rachel Anspa and Kiana Paharo, who run things behind the scenes at the Abolition Democracy Initiative. Um, the ADI funds this reading series with the help of generous grants from the executive vice chancellor and provost and the chancellor's office here at UC Berkeley. So thank you, chancellor, executive vice chancellor, university bigwigs for funding this program. Um, thank you audience members for being in community with us today. Please come back next Monday even, um, March 7th at noon, we've got a second online critical conversations panel. Um, titled Black Writers in the Bay, um, featuring Tongo Eisen Martin and Tinia Lunsford Links. Um, you'll find details about that and about our future events on the African American Studies website, africam.berkeley.edu. Folks, thanks for joining us. Bye for now. <laughs>